Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Julius Caesar, Napoleon, Mussolini, Rico Bandello, Michael Corleone, and Tony Soprano, Italian and Italian-American Caesars, mafiosi and mama's boys, guidos and gangsters. How have they become part of the myths and narratives of the Italian-American experience? Here to tell us the truth behind the fiction of Italian Americans is Robert Vescuzzi, professor of English and executive director of the Etha R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities at Brooklyn College. He has served as the president of the Italian American Writers Association and has published a book, Astoria, which won a 1996 American Book Award, a performance poem titled An Oration on the Most Recent Death of Christopher Columbus, a poem collection, a new geography of time, and a slew of articles in journals and professional magazine. Welcome, Bob. Hi. This is a real pleasure. I thoroughly enjoyed this book, Buried Caesars and Other Secrets of Italian-American Writing. How did you come to write this book, this, which really is an eye-opener to an Italian-American about Italian-American writing? Well, you know, I always wanted to write about the lives that uh, my grandparents had led and, and Italian-Americans around me in general had, had led. And I thought I knew a lot about it because, after all, my grandmother made ravioli, you know. <laughs> but when I was in graduate school in 1968, after Martin Luther King was killed, uh, a dean at NYU asked me to teach in a Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Scholarship Program. Obviously, your background prepared you for that. I didn't know anything about it. So I, I called up, uh, with the arrogance of a young person, I called up Kenneth Clark, who was a great expert sure. here. And he gave me a long list of books, which like a good graduate student, I sat down and read. And then I walked into the class that summer and I was ready to teach them about writing and jazz and so I'll talk about Bessie Smith and Duke Ellington. They didn't know about Bessie Smith and Duke Ellington. They didn't know about anything. They, had re they weren't teaching black history in those days mm -hmm. in high schools. And I thought, wow, these kids have really been robbed of their history. And, and then it dawned on me that the same thing was true about me. I mean, I knew something about ancient Rome because I went to a Jesuit school. So did I. Which <laughs> right. took place mostly in ancient Rome right. and in the Inquisition, and I knew something about that. And the Renaissance, that right, was it. Right. But I didn't know anything about the history that had produced us. How did it happen that all of these millions and millions and millions of Italians, Italians, you know, people don't like to move. These are people that... If, they, if, if they're born in a certain bed, they feel that they should die in that bed, otherwise they're superficial. You know? <laughs> All of these people suddenly pick up and leave and go to another country that's really in another eon from where they are. Mm -hmm. they, they are born in the Middle Ages and they get on the boat and they wake up in New York in the 20th century. It couldn't have been easy. Right. How did that happen? So I started reading. And I started reading history. And... After a while, it dawned on me that reading history wasn't enough because really to understand the people the way a literary person like me understands them, you right. have to read the literature. Right. And I couldn't do that because I didn't know Italian. So bit by bit, I worked myself to the point where I thought, there's a lot of things that I have to learn. And I started to learn them. And I started to realize that it was a very hard thing to do because there were no books that were designed for the predicament of a person like me. Mm -hmm. And I wrote this book, really, to be the book that I needed to read. Okay. You know, that a person like me would need to read. Okay. That's what this is. Okay, talk about what, what is the significance of the buried Caesars? I mean, uh, okay. Dennis Hamill wrote in a review of the book, quote, you've come not to bury Caesar, but to exhume him. <laughs> talk about this exhumation. Okay. You know, when the Italians started to come here in 1880, Italy had just unified itself, mm -hmm. and it was a mess. It wasn't very, a very successful unification. And the way that they decided to make it succeed was they developed a, 
a na very nationalistic slash imperialistic program of war and imperial expansion. Um, and they beat the drum and they blew the trumpet very loud for years and years and years and years. And these Italians who came here, even if they hadn't heard it when they were in Italy, they heard it when they got to New York because the Italian newspapers were filled with this stuff. Okay. And Italian nationalist propaganda was a steady accompaniment of life in the Italian colonies from 1880 until 1940. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1941, as you remember, uh, in the long history of Italian foreign policy, the supreme achievement uh, of idiocy occurred, which was Mussolini declared war on the United States. Um, sort of hard to believe it even now. Well, what did that do? It took all of these people, there were about five million at that time, all of these people who had been reading all this fine stuff in their Italian newspapers, and it made them in one stroke of the pen enemy aliens. They actually, if they hadn't taken American citizenship, they had to go to the post office and register as enemy aliens. Well, some Italians were actually interned in California, yes. and, in, and in England, uh, you pointed this out in the book, Churchill said, collar them. Yes, Put them collar in jail. a lot of them, and they, and they shipped them off to Canada and Australia. A whole bunch of them were sunken by a U-boat uh, in the North Sea. This was 1940, mm -hmm. June of 1940, July of 1940. Um, about 446, mostly Scottish Italians. There were a lot of Italians in Glasgow and Edinburgh. But here, some were put in concentration camps. Many more of them were just terrified. Uh, and some, 600,000 or so, were in the armed forces. My father yes. served yes. in the, you know, in, in France and in Germany during the Second World well, War. Well, along with this terrification, on the other side, there was Americanization, because Posters appeared in all the Italian neighborhoods almost immediately. Don't speak the enemy's language, speak American. And so they did. Mm -hmm. And so people who grew up in Italian America after that, most of us can't speak Italian. Neither can, I, right. I certainly can't, but you, you learned Italian to write the book. I learned, while I was writing the book, I, okay. read, I got a grant and I went to Italy for a year and I learned Italian. I could curse. And I knew the food. That was right, it. Right, And that's, I, that's all, that's still where I'm at. I could curse and I could also say, shut up and eat. Right. That come got said to me a come great on. Deal, right? Well, I mean, that's that part of the heritage. Right. Uh, but what happened was that all of this ideology about Italy that they had been imbibing in their conversation on their radio programs, newspapers, suddenly they couldn't really talk about it in so many words, in, in the words that they learned it, but it remained there as a kind of a political unconscious. And those are the buried Caesars. Mm -hmm. There they are. And Italian Americans continue to carry all these sort of quasi religious ideological beliefs about what Italy is and what the Italian language. For example, all Italian Americans believe that if they speak Italian, it isn't the real Italian. Right, it's a right. dialect. It's a dialect. Right. right. The real Italian is a, a dialect of Tuscan that was chosen for, by various reasons, which I talk about in the book actually, as the national language mm -hmm. of Italy. Mm -hmm. and it has been relentlessly promoted by the Italian government ever since. And up until the advent of television in Italy, that promotion never really succeeded. Television finally taught them all to speak Italian. Uh, but most Italian Americans, of course, don't watch Italian television. Right. They didn't grow up watching it. And so if they speak Italian at all, they speak some kind of antiquated Sicilian or Neapolitan Thank or whatever. You. When they go to Italy, nobody can understand that. Right. And um, you're an American anyway when you go And you're an American Italy. anyway. Um, so... The, the, uh, the belief in an Italian language is really more like a religious belief. It's like, a, it's like the be belief that olive oil can be not just virgin, but extra virgin. Hey, come on. What does extra virgin mean exactly? How can you, not means, even thinking about isn't sex, it, but it, the, I see. let alone having See, you it. understand. You, you, have see, a, you have a better I'm, education than I do, that's well, for sure. That's, I, I guess. I, I've never been able to figure it out. But anyway, it's like that. Uh, along with that went a whole lot of other beliefs, like they believed that this language was invented by Dante Alighieri, um, who wrote a treatise on the Italian language, or, as he called it, New Latin, in about 1300, um, as, a, as a kind of a prologue to writing this great poem in right. Italian that he wrote. So they believed, my grandfather told me this when I was two years old, that Dante Alighieri invented Italian, and therefore he invented Italy. As a direct result, Okay, of course, there was a, a, a waiting period of right. 560 years. No, we understand but, this, but there is, there is a grain of truth here. A grain. 
A grain. Just a grain. Yeah, maybe a little less than a grain. Oh, okay. But, um, Argue with me. Go it, ahead. It, it, you know, it became a kind of an ideological theme, and it became a very important theme in the history of Italian literature. Um, la questione della lingua, they call it, the, the language problem. Because it never really succeeded in becoming, until after the Risorgimento, it never succeeded in becoming anything except the language of a very small, educated elite. elite. And what should it be, what should be included, what should not be included, people entertain themselves for centuries arguing about these matters. Um, so that's one example of the kind of thing that people believed. And by Caesars, let me just add one Go more ahead. thing to that. Go by ahead. Caesars, I mean something a little special. Uh, Antonio, no, I know you do. Antonio Gramsci. Uh, uh, who had, is? Who, who is uh, the great uh, Marxist theoretician of Italian ideology, among other things. Uh, says that a Caesar is something that Italian politics, starting with Roman politics, invent to deal with an impossible contradiction. When push comes to shove and there are two parties and they can't agree, they throw up this figure of the all-powerful, all-seeing, universal genius Caesar. Mm. Um, well, I used it here to refer to ideological beliefs that cover contradictions. Like, the biggest contradiction in Italian-American history is the contradiction between all this imperialist propaganda that they were constantly mm -hmm. going on about Italy has the best navy, Italy, blah, 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 blah. Italy is destined to rule Africa. That was a standard line right up until the Second World War. On the one hand, and on the other hand, the actual reality of the lives of all of these Italians who had to leave Italy because they were starving to death and who, when they got to New York, were treated not a whole lot better than slaves. Right. Um, so for people like that to be constantly on about how they discovered America and how they painted the Sistine Chapel and how they were going to rule Africa and everything has something a, a little uh, almost schizophrenic about it. Right, and, and this, this notion, this, this, this schizophrenia, if you will, pervades Americans' views and Italian-American views of themselves in the culture, the, you know, and, and, and your essay on The Sopranos, which we'll get to shortly, mm -hmm. is a brilliant example. And the gangster as a mythic figure, and particularly the Italian-American gangster, who mm -hmm. in, for the most part is the gangster, right. suffers from this. Before, but before we get into that, I want to throw out a couple of quotes in the book that, that struck me as, as, as interesting as a non-literature scholar. Mm -hmm. Literature, you argue, is the last citadel you can crack as an outsider, mm -hmm. and that the reason that you wrote the book was to, to highlight the unappreciated contributions Italian-Americans have made to our nat natural, national literature and film. Mm -hmm. just, just elaborate a bit on, on that. Okay. Uh, literature being the last citadel you need to crack as an outsider, and Italians being outsiders, or Italian-Americans okay. being outsiders. Okay, well, you know, they didn't master the language. They were uh, absolutely an underclass for generations. Um, and then after the war, the war basically disinherited them politically and culturally. They lost their language, and along with it, they lost all the Italian politics, because Italians were either fascists or communists, there wasn't any room for that in 1947 right. in New York City. Right. You're one of those things, right. right? So what did they become? Republicans. It's kind of a pretty severe fall. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, and, uh, not all of them. Some of them became Democrats, but the Democrats really weren't interested in them because the Democrats were mostly Irish, and they, they had their well, thing. I mean, clearly, and, there, right. were, there, was, there was ethnic politics involved in right. this as well. And the Republicans recruited them because they needed you know, fresh blood. And they... Uh, well, they were disinherited, and they were, remember, the, uh, the immigrants were mostly illiterate, l large numbers of them. Sure. They didn't enter very quickly into the whole American system of literate uh, scholarship and study and discourse. So it took a long time, and although lots of Italian-American writers have published books during this period, until very recently, there was very little sense of Italian-American writing as a subject. And okay. what does it give you? I mean, that's really the question right. behind this. Right. What does it give you? It gives you a sense of the complex subjectivity, 
the historical awareness, the cultural awareness, the, the, the sense of negotiation between all this inherited contradiction okay. on the one hand and the demands of American life on the other and how Italians have ne negotiated this mm -hmm. and what they have to offer. So that for Italian Americans to understand themselves to the degree that they really need to do if they're going to be full protagonists in American life. They really need to know their own literature, just in the same way that African Americans or Jewish Americans have done the same thing. Okay, now why have Italian American authors be, been generally overlooked as Italian American authors? A lot of them were really ashamed of it. For example, some of the really successful ones like uh, Salvatore Lombino, who is not known by that name, is known by the name Evan Hunter, who wrote The Blackboard Jungle. And oh, or Ed McBain. As in, as that's him, too. Ed McBain, Ed McBain the, the also, right. precinct He novels. had actually about seven or eight pseudonyms. pseudonyms. They're all listed in this book someplace. Um, but he figured he could never get any place with an Italian name. And plenty of Italians have done similar things. Well, in fact, when we come to The Sopranos, David Chase, who is the writer and the executive producer, was... De Cesare. The, thank you. Well, he wasn't. His grandfather, his grandfather. His grandfather okay. changed the name. So... Uh, there was a lot of that, and there was also I, I, it, something that's a little hard to understand, and I don't pretend to explain it in this book. There was a, a lack of awareness that, that literature is really a common project, that literature is not made just by a genius sitting alone in a room. Mm -hmm. Literature is made by, you know, reviewing each other's books, having parties, going to dinner, giving readings together, all this other kind of and stuff. And living the experience. And, right. But also living the, living the literary the life, life right, right? Right. There was very little of that. When I started doing this in 1979 is when I began at Brooklyn College, I invited several, I won't name them, but some very well-known Italian-American writers at that time, older guys, to come and talk to my classes. Mm -hmm. And they did. Not once did one of them say to me, so kid, how you doing? You're writing a book? Do you need an agent? Nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Which is a normal thing to do. Sure. But they didn't understand. No one had done that for them. Perhaps I don't really know, but uh, they, that was that usage really wasn't there. So there wasn't the kind of social web that there needed to be. This is one of the reasons that we founded a writers' association. Okay, now you've you've talked about the, the burdens of the Italian American writer. What are those burdens? Well, probably the biggest single burdens. Uh, there are two of them really. One of them is the mafia, and the other one is Italy. The mafia. Let's start with Italy first, because I want to okay. transition into. I want to okay. talk about with, the mafia. The, the, trou the trouble with Italy is it, that it's just too wonderful for us. You know, uh, Italian Americans can't resist saying, "We invented the helicopter. We painted the we, we, the Mona Come on, Lisa. Lisa. Come right. on. But you know, we didn't. Mm -hmm. That was a, a Florentine, mm -hmm. um, slightly strange genius in the 15th century. Uh, who didn't live in a country called Italy because it didn't exist. Right. Um, and the, the trouble with that is, there's, I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with boasting about what your ancestors did, but if you confuse what they did with what you did, You're then, in it's, trouble. then it's a problem. Um, and we were, for various reasons, some of them we already talked about, a little ashamed. We, we felt that we had lost our country by coming here. Then we were treated very badly. We were shamed. Italian-Americans were lynched in the hundreds. Um, Louisiana, New Orleans. That was the most famous one, but right. there were plenty of others. That was the biggest one. Right. Um, somebody says, I can't remember who, some scholar who has studied this says that between 1880 and 1940, a thousand Italian Americans were lynched in this country. It's just crazy. Astounding. Astound well, in any event, the one that, we, that I know of is the one in New Orleans right. in 1891, where 11 Sicilians were lynched right. for a crime that they had already been declared innocent of. Right. Uh, so, and there was lots of that kind of stuff. Sacco and Benzetti is the other great case. Right. Um, Italians felt very bad about themselves. And so um, there's all of that. And by comparison, of course, Italy is a whole department store full of wonderfulness. You know, popes and kings and princes and paintings and sculptures. Great food and, blah, blah. and great architecture. Right, right. And come on. And so the temptation to arrogate to yourself glories that belong to someone else has proved irresistible to a lot of Italian Americans. But the, the result, of course, is to constantly reinforce the prestige of a pyramid where we have always occupied the basement. Okay, okay. 
So oh, that's Italy's, a burden. Okay. Uh, Italy is a burden. Let's turn to the mafia. How many times have you seen The Godfather? Oh, who knows? Many. How, and, you, and you're and you an avid watcher of The Sopranos, obviously. I studied it in order to write this book. Do you, did, do you watch reruns? I have all of the DVDs. Oh, you have all of them. Right. My kids buy them for me at Christmas, right? Nice. <laughs> What explains the energy and endurance of the gangster story, the mafia story, beginning with, well, as you point out, Burnett's book, uh, Little, Caesar, Little Caesar, which was converted into a movie by right. Melvin Leroy in 1930 that starred Edward G. Robinson right. as Rico Bandello, right. for whom the Rico law was named, in fact. That's right. Go ahead. Talk to me. What explains this endurance? What, what is it? Nothing nothing uh, in popular culture better attaches itself to the whole symptomatology of Italian-American history than the mafia story because it is both a symptom and the cause of a symptom. Okay. All right. It is the symptom basically of the double colonization of Italian-Americans. They're colonized on the one hand by Italy. Italy, now, Italy is not only a burden. Italy is a burden if you use it this way. And unfortunately, as long as you're not aware of it, there's almost no other way of using it. Italian-Americans, on the one hand, feel rejected by Italy. On the other hand, they feel religiously obliged to buy Italian exports. If you, uh, we were talking about this earlier. One of my definitions of an Italian-American is someone who feels obliged at least once a week to eat or drink something that was produced in Italy. Well, it's not an obligation. It's a joy. Come on. It is a joy. It is a joy. It's not a burden. It's like going to... I had ravioli last night, in fact. Come on, give me a break. It is wonderful. I'm not saying that oh, it's okay. not wonderful. Okay. But we also feel obliged. Okay. There okay. Is, if I'll you, buy it. If you, if you lived on, you know, corned beef and cabbage and frankfurters for months and months and months and months, you would feel an enormous lack in your existence, right? So that's what I mean. By okay. Okay. Like okay. 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 What that does is it continuously reinforces the prestige of Italy, okay? Okay. And the uh, peripheral nature of Italian Americans who have to import the cheese because you can't have Parmigiano from Wisconsin. Even but you though, can't. It's no, not you good. can't. I don't. I don't buy no, it either. Come on, no, 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 be I understand. serious. I understand. Okay. okay. So that's I'm the sorry. I'm sorry. And I'm the sorry. other thing is the colonization by Americans, who have found ways, and the mafia image is one of them. To keep Italian Americans a little bit out of the ring, you know, look at what they did to Mario Cuomo. Look what they did to Geraldine Ferraro. I mean, it was continuous. Is whispers. Nancy Pelosi next? Well, we'll see. We'll see. Let's see how close to power she really gets. Okay. I heard somebody. She was interviewed on television the other night, and I heard someone on CNN yesterday say, "Wasn't she terrifying?" <laughs> she's a little. Yeah. You know, I mean, she's she's smart. Mm -hmm. She's smart. She's brilliant. She's determined. She knows what she's doing. She's she has that kind of clarity that's forged so we, by suffering, but... Uh, but we live, we, Italian-Americans, sort of live under this cloud or under the shadow of the mafia. There is this, this expectation that we've got, right. you know, we've got thugs in our, our family. I mean, I didn't know about mm. the mafia until I read Mario Puzo's book. Right. That was it. Right. I mean, that's 1969. I grew up without, without I think knowing this. An awful lot of us would say the same thing. It's, it's really incredible. And, then, and going to The Sopranos... Not only am I an Italian American, but I live in northern New Jersey, and people from, you know, St. Louis even say, Is that what it's like in northern New Jersey? No, it's not. And don't you feel really left out that you don't know? No, that's, that's <laughs> true. But I, when, I watch, when I watch The Sopranos, I try to pick out spots right. that I've been to. But the, let's, let's get back. What, what is it about the gangster myth that so attracts Americans and defines Italian Americans? Well, I mean, as far as Americans are concerned, it's perfect. I mean, it is, after all, the mafia that you see in the movies is an American invention. The Sicilian mafia is nothing like that. The mafia was invented basically by Burnett, I mean, this mafia, by sure. Burnett and a whole bunch of imitators after that, and then it was perfected by the FBI and the Kafova Committee in the, in the 50s and 60s. They invented the mafia as a kind of a spectre, spectre bridegroom to the American empire. That this mafia is an international corporation. They have board meetings in banks. They, you know, they connect everything. I mean, most of the gangsters in real life are much more like Paulie Walnuts, you know, uh, right. stealing a coffee pot. Uh, 
But part of it is, but it was produced by Italian Americans, by a Mario Puzo, by a Martin Scorsese, by a Francis Ford Coppola. And in fact, as you point out here, the Sopranos modeled themselves on their yes. cinematic images. So reality is being based on cinematic images that don't reflect the reality. It's, it's no, but they do. Bizarre. They do reflect the reality. They ref they reflect a social reality. They reflect what I just called a minute ago, a double colonization. Okay. I mean, and you know, when people object to Italian-American writers writing about this, it seems equivalent to me to people objecting to African-American writers writing about the heritage of slavery. Sure. Or Jewish-American writers writing sure. about the heritage of the Holocaust. This is the burden that we have to carry. And if we don't write about it, then it will only be written about by people who don't understand what it feels like from the inside. And that's what makes The Soprano so brilliant, oh. is that he shows you what it is to be a stereotype from inside, the way Shakespeare does with Shylock. Oh, it's quite excellent. a remarkable okay. achievement. Okay. We only have, I mean, this t the time flew. We only have 30 seconds. You teach Italian-Americans in literature and film. Right. What books should an Italian-American read to sort of understand themselves, if you will? Okay, well, they should certainly read The Godfather. They should read Christ in Concrete by Pietro Di Donato. They should read Ask the Dust by John Fonte. They should read Umbertina by Helen Barolini. They should read The Poems of Lawrence Ferlinghetti oh, and Diane Coney de Prima. Island. Well, I know some of that, Coney Island right. of the Mind. Go ahead. Right. Uh, they should read Dante Lillo's Underworld. Right. Um, that's a pretty good reading list. Yeah. What film should they see other than The Godfather, Mean Streets? Goodfellas. 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 Um, they should see Give Us This Day. One of the things that I use in this, in this uh, course is A Night at the Opera as being... This will close it. Go as ahead. Being, as being a kind of a complete encyclopedia of all the stereotypes about Italian immigrants that's done... Not by Italians, but done in a kind of a loving way. It's really quite a surprise. So a night, we'll, we'll end it with a night at the opera. Okay.